In July, President Lincoln brought in John Pope to become commander of the Union's newly created Army of Virginia. Pope exaggerated wildly about his previous battles and cracked down hard on Southern sympathizers. Many were incarcerated in the old Capitol prison in Washington. The Confederate Army, in turn, arrested many Northern sympathizers and sent them to Libby Prison in Richmond. Life was hard for everyone. General Robert E. Lee, seeing a window of opportunity to strike Pope, sent Stonewall Jackson around Pope's army. On August 26, 1862, Jackson cut Pope's line of supply and communications at Manassas Junction. Pope abandoned his positions on the Rappahannock River and sent his forces after Jackson. It had been a year and a month since the two armies met on the same battlefield at Manassas. The second battle of Manassas proved to be as disastrous for the Union Army as the first. Confederate troops held firm as the Union casualties began to mount. Even when they ran out of ammunition, Jackson's men continued fighting, helping their enemies with stones. At Fairfax Station, seven miles from Bull Run, Clara Barton arrived to tend the wounded. She described the scene to a friend. The ground for acres was thinly wooded slope, and among the trees on the leaves and grass were laid the wounded who were pouring in by the scores of wagon loads, as picked up on the field under the flag of truce. All day they came, and the whole hillside was covered. Bales of hay were broken open and scattered over the ground like littering for cattle and the sore and starving men were laid upon it. Barton treated the wounded and prepared to send them back on the train to Washington. She wrote of her war experiences. You must never so much as think whether you like it or not, whether it is bearable or not. You must never think of anything except the need and how to meet it. I may be compelled to face danger, but never fear it. While our soldiers can stand and fight, I can stand and feed and nurse them. Clara Barton became known as the Angel of the Battlefield and would later found the American Red Cross. The need for her services were great, as the Second Battle of Manassas produced more casualties than the first. The Confederacy suffered 9,000 dead and wounded, and the Union, 10,000. On September 1st, during a torrential afternoon thunderstorm, another battle was fought just outside Fairfax Courthouse. This proved to be the largest battle in Fairfax County. It is known as the Battle of Chantilly. In the south, it is sometimes called the Battle of Ox Hill. General Pope's forces were initially deployed around Centerville in strong positions, and General Lee sent Jackson around Pope's flank in an attempt to cut off uh, General Pope's escape to Washington. This movement, however, was detected and Union forces moved to intercept Jackson. The fighting at Chantilly proved to be a draw from a tactical standpoint. Uh, General Pope was eventually able to escape back to Washington, but the fighting at Chantilly cost the Union Army the loss of two of its best commanders. Generals Phil Kearney and Isaac Stevens were both killed in action. After the Battle of Chantilly, the focus of the war moved from Fairfax. Lee took his troops north to Maryland to a place called Antietam, and the bloodiest day in the Civil War. Jeb Stewart made a return visit to Fairfax in late December. At Burke Station, in what came to be known as the Christmas Raid, Stewart captured supply wagons, cut telegraph wires, tore up the railroads, and captured 200 prisoners. He had the audacity to wire the Union quartermaster, complaining of the poor quality of the mules he had taken. They are scarcely strong enough to pull the wagons carrying the Union goods. Colonel John Singleton Mosby served under Jeb Stewart before organizing Mosby's Rangers in 1863. He operated as an independent cavalry unit, 
and made many successful raids behind Union lines, keeping the Confederacy's hopes alive. Spying on Union soldiers who were often quartered in Fairfax homes was a common occurrence. One Confederate spy, an attractive young lady named Antonia Ford, was no stranger to war. When Union troops invaded her home to loot, she cleverly charmed Union soldiers while hiding many of the family's valuables under her hoop skirt. She was so effective in supplying Jeb Stewart with information about Union troops that he awarded her a commission as a major and named her his honorary aide-de-camp. In March 1863, Union General Edward Stoughton went to a party in Fairfax. Antonia learned of the event from some of the guests who were staying at her house. After a night of partying, the general returned to his bedroom and fell soundly asleep. Shortly thereafter, he was jolted awake by a sharp slap on the rear end. Have you ever heard of Mosby? Mosby asked. Yes, have you caught him? General Stoughton replied. No, but he has caught you. Along with General Stoughton, Mosby captured two captains, 30 privates, and 58 horses. When told of Mosby's raid, President Lincoln was said to have remarked, I don't care much about the loss of a general, as I can make another with a stroke of a pen. But I sure hate to lose those horses. Mosby's daring feats made him a living legend. He became known as the Gray Ghost. Many Union men actually admired him and wanted to learn more about him. A secret meeting was arranged one night for some of them to meet a few of Mosby's men at the home of Sarah Summers Clark. According to Sarah's sister, Mrs. Bell Holden, Mother acted as hostess and they talked in the friendliest manner possible. They told each other how much they regretted having to kill each other and be so cruel. Later, they left in peace, and no one ever knew they had met in our house. Mosby's raids would effectively keep the war going another year. As the war drew to a close, Mosby disbanded his troops rather than have them surrender. In the end, the Union prevailed. There would be no separate Southern nation. On April 9th, 1865, Lee surrendered. Mrs. Bell Holden's memories echo the bleak stories of many Southerners left in Fairfax County as the war ended. I heard of Lee's surrender at Appomattox. For us, the world had fallen. We went back to our old home near Centerville where we found only the hull of a house, ruined fences and devastated fields, and began with thousands of others many of whom had fared much worse than we, the almost hopeless task of reconstructing the South. The war left the once prosperous farming community of Fairfax totally devastated. The remaining population began the long process of recovering their lives from the ashes of war. We are, we are climbing. Freed slaves, though poor and dislocated, would begin a period of readjustment to a political and economic status as free individuals. Some moved on to Washington and other cities of the North, and some stayed where they were and found work. Others were absorbed into the free black communities near Centerville and Chantilly that had existed since the 18th century. In the years to follow, Fairfax County would face the challenges of reconstruction and the rebuilding of farms and families. Prosperity would return, but it would be a long time coming. <laughs> 